us today, right? <laughs> Just to see your smiling face, right? You know, and all the snow that goes with it. Well, we're glad you're here today. We're glad you're here. We've come to worship the Lord. We're few in number today, but that's all right. We can still have a good time in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I'm glad you're here. And he is the one we've come here to honor, to praise, and to worship. And I hope this morning you can say, I'd rather have Jesus than riches Amen. or fame, than a stay at home or whatever, but to be here and worshiping with God's people. Praise the Lord. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's good to be in your house today. And we're thankful for these that have come. And Father, we come before you today needing to draw near to you. We sense your presence already this morning, Father, and that for that we thank you. We'd ask that the Holy Spirit would have liberty to work in each and every one of our hearts and lives. And that from this service today, that it would be a committal of our obedience and our allegiance to you. It'd be a reminder of what you came to do for us upon the cross and how we have been delivered from the condemnation of our sin. But Lord, not just delivered, but we have been made possible that we don't have to live in the bondage of sin and the slavery to sin. And we're thankful for that today because of what you did for us. And Father, today, should there be those in our midst here today that do not know you as their Lord and Savior, they might have a head knowledge, but they've never experienced in the heart knowing Jesus Christ, having surrendered their all to you and invited you into their life. We pray, Father, today that out of this service today, your spirit would speak to their hearts and they would be willing to make that decision for you. We pray for those that are shut in, that can't be here today, some who are under the weather, who are sickly. We pray for them and their families. We just ask for healing. We pray, Father, for our missionary family as they minister in a variety of places. We ask your hand to blessing upon them and healing for those who need a touch of your hand of physical healing upon their bodies. Bless this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Good to have you again in our services today. Today we're going to be observing the Lord's table. Following the morning, or following the preaching service, we're going to have the Lord's table, and then later we're going to follow that with a business meeting. And I trust you've prepared yourself for that as well. Don't forget the prayer meeting and Bible study this Wednesday evening to be in the church basement. As the last Wednesday of the month, we have prayer meeting in the basement, and we share coffee and snacks and whatnot, but we have a good time. And we break bread, we eat bread, and we have good fellowship and good time in prayer together. And then also, next Sunday evening, it's going to be a great day because it's going to be Christmas in January for us here at Bethlehem. And uh, we kind of move that back to the month of January when all the hubbub has stopped. And we have a white elephant gift exchange. Sometime after 5 o'clock, we'll come and bring passing dishes and eat, fill our bellies. And then we just have a lot of laughter and good time, good fellowship and always a good time with the white elephant gift exchange. Sometimes it gets nasty once in a while. But I mean, people say, I want this, and they exchange. You know how white elephants go. But it's fun, and we're looking forward to that, and trust you plan to be here for that. Is there any other announcements that need to be shared from the floor this morning? Drew. I just want to thank everybody that's uh, donated snacks to the Christ Seekers. Really appreciate that. I think if we get snowed in and we got to stay here, we've got enough food down there. <laughs> We're okay, so. Okay. That sounds good. Good to know that. Any birthdays this morning? Sir, yes. Uh, I'm Larry Burkhart. Okay. Uh, Christine Birmingham, my mm -hmm. daughter. Uh, she was going to be here this morning, but uh, Paige had a really rough night last night, so... Uh, she wasn't able to make it, but uh, I wanted to come to thank the church for your very generous gift to her. She was abs absolutely flabbergasted. She uh, didn't expect anything like that, but uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Wonderful. I remember that guy when I was just a little shaver a long time ago. Quite a singer, Mr. Burkhart. And... Uh, if you got a song up your sleeve sometime, I'd be glad to have you share it. He probably, I don't, do you still sing any, do you, Larry? I'm, I'm sorry. Do I, you still sing? Do what? Do you still, still sing? I, not like I used to. <laughs> <laughs> I, this way. I still sing. Yeah. Nobody enjoys it. 
It seems to me, I remember you used to sing with John Starr and Bob Starr. I used to have to sing because Mom was a choir director. <laughs> well, it's good to have you today. Good to have you today. Anything else that needs to be shared? Any birthdays this morning? Any anniversaries this morning? Connie? Could you please stand and turn in your hymnals to page 265? saying is cleanse me is on uh, 410 in your hymnal um, if you feel free that you'd like to sing along with me on this it um, says it all
is an important ordinance of the church. The Lord gave to the church. And we as a church observe this quarterly. Some churches do it weekly. We do it quarterly. And it's a time when we should have come and examined ourselves, prepared our heart for this table. Because this table speaks as to what Jesus Christ came to do for us. But it also speaks to the fact what he is going to do in the future and really what he's doing for us at this present point in time. And he has provided for us that a new life that we have in Jesus Christ, not to go back and live the old life that we were living. <laughs> you know, there are people who make a profession of faith. They come to know the Lord, but they seemingly go back and not to be judgmental, but they go back and seemingly live the same old life they were living. Crawl right back in the same old rut. Well, that's not what we were saved to do, to crawl back in the same old rut. We were saved to get out of that old rut. That doesn't mean that we walk on water and we're perfect, None, but it does mean that we have the ability to live a life that is a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. He's given us that means to do that. And this Lord's table speaks to that very thing. If you have your Bible, go with me to the book of Luke chapter 22. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke both speak to the Lord's table as well as the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I just want to read a few verses that sets the stage for the Lord's table as the disciples and the Lord Himself was going to observe this, this table. We're going to be partaking of this table like we have done in the past. We have the juice and the wafer all in these prepared cups. Unlike we serve them individually, they're going to get your cup and the juice all in this little nice prepackaged container. And we're going to let you come down the center aisle and then go out on the side and go back to your pew in just a little bit. But uh, we want to think about that and talk about that because that's an important ordinance. I think it's important that we do that quarterly. It's good for us to be reminded, and it's good for our young people when they come up from downstairs, those who have made a profession of faith, they share with us, and it's important that we do that. It says in Luke chapter 22 and verse 7, it says, Then came the day of the unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. When you read that, you will find the two are spoken of in conjunction together. The feast of the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, it followed. And so they would speak to that end, and they spoke of them as being one almost, but they were two individual separate feasts. It says in verse 8, And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. You know, I read that passage of Scripture, and I wonder if that man ever thought about his job being unimportant in the course of his day. You ever have days you think about what I do and what I say and who the people I meet is really unimportant? But here's this guy that's bearing a pitcher of water, and this was an important individual because the Lord foretold that. He said, There shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enter in. And you shall say unto the good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found, as he has said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, um, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And likewise also took the cup. After the same, uh, after the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Here we have an account, Luke's uh, remembrance of that time that he had with the Lord. And each of the apostles, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, recount that time. And uh, there's a little bit of variation in how they say it, but it's pretty much the same thing of what happened there that particular 
uh, night as the Lord's table was instituted. So we have here this first account mentioned here of the Lord's table that was instituted. And when was it instituted? It was instituted at the time of the Passover. I think if you ask most Christians, do you know what the Passover is? Do you have any knowledge of the Passover? I think most Christians have a basic knowledge of the Passover. The Passover was when the nation of Israel was in bondage to Egypt and God was about to deliver them out of Egypt and they were to kill the best lamb that they had, a lamb without blemish, a lamb without spot. And you know what that lamb pointed to, do you not? It pointed to the one and only Jesus Christ who would come and be your lamb and my lamb who would be, in essence, our Passover, uh, our sacrifice for us. And they would kill this lamb. They would place the blood on the doorpost and they ate the flesh of the lamb. But also, we don't mention this much, but it talks about the bitter herbs that they partook of, and those bitter herbs reminded them of the suffering that they experienced in Egypt. And then there was the unleavened bread, the bread they ate in haste, the bread that hadn't, uh, didn't have the leaven, it hadn't risen or anything of the such. And there again, it reminded them of leaving Egypt, but it remind, it's a reminder to us, is it not, that leaven is a type of sin. And that's not to be a part of our life when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Passover, though, was a Jewish feast, when you study this, that all Jewish males were commanded to observe, and it occurred yearly on the 15th month of Niacin, beginning in the evening. Now, our calendar, we begin a new day uh, after midnight. The first second after midnight begins a new day, but their new day began in the evening. And it, it says here in the 15th of the month of Niacin, when you go back and read about this, it, that's when this Passover began. And it was at, a time, at this time that Jesus instituted what you and I are talking about this morning, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. And it's a feast of remembrance. It's a feast that we celebrate and what he came to do for us, for you and I, born again believers. We call it the church. And what do we mean when we say the church? Do we mean anybody and everybody that just darkens the door of a building called a church? They are the church. Well, no, the church is men and women who've been born again. There are people who come to church that have never been born again, that are not a part of the true church. You are not a part of the true church, as far as God is concerned, until you've been born again, washed in the blood. And that places you into the body of Christ. The Bible tells us back in the book of 1 Corinthians that we have been baptized into the body of Christ and speaking about the act of our commitment to Jesus Christ, acknowledging the fact that we are a sinner. We've sinned and fallen short of the righteousness of God. We repent of our sin, but we recognize that in and of itself is not going to get us uh, out of this mess that we're in, but we have to receive what Jesus Christ did for us. We have to believe what He came to do for us. He came to shed His blood on the cross for your sin and my sin, and when I, by faith, receive him as my Lord and Savior. I invite him to come into my heart and life. It's at that point in time the condemnation of my sin has been removed, laid upon him. All of it was laid upon him at the cross. But it has been credited to me, to my account, that I have been justified. I have been redeemed. I have been declared righteous in the sight of Almighty God because at that point in time Almighty God sees me through the blood of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the church, we're talking about born again. And the Lord here, when He instituted this Lord's Supper, He says to you and I, everybody that would ever become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and bear in mind, the Passover was for who? Was it for Gentiles? No. The Passover was for the Jewish people. But the Lord's table is for Jews and Gentiles, men and women who have been born again, and we call that the church. They have been placed into the body of Christ. This is an ordinance that has been set aside for us. And the Lord says in chapter 2, verse 19, the very last portion of that verse, He says, Do this in remembrance of me. Why is that? Because He delivered us from the condemnation of our sin. That is something we ought to do in remembrance of Him, what He has done for us. Do you remember when you came to know the Lord as your personal Savior? That was a great day. There's a song we sing. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Praise the Lord. That's something we ought to get excited over. Amen? Amen. Something we ought to praise the Lord over because our name has been written in God's Lamb's Book of Life. That's something to rejoice in. Our name wasn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life because we're taking the table. Our name wasn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life because we participated in any ordinance. Because if that was the case, then we'd be, we were, we would be saying to the world that we are saved because we go to this church and we participate in this ordinance. We would be saying to the world that we're saved by our works. Are we saved by our works? Not at all. If we were saved by our works, then it would no longer be grace. And I've told you many times before, when I went to school in Eden, oftentimes I have to 
take a look at what the answer key had to say to see if I had the right answer on the math problem. I want you to know when you examine the answer key of God's word, the answer key of God's word says that you and I are saved by faith through grace, not that of ourselves. It's a what? A gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So all of these ordinances that we celebrate and all that we do is the things that we do because we love Him, we want to worship Him, we want to praise Him, and they call attention to what He did for us and we give glory to Him. But they in themselves have no power to save us. It's only Jesus Christ that has the power to save you and I. You and I bring our worthless, good-for-nothing, sinful rags. The Bible says all of our righteousness is filthy rags. And we lay it at the feet of Jesus Christ. And what does He wonderfully do? He, by faith through grace, saves us. That's something to rejoice in, I believe, this morning. Well, when we take this table, this meal, we call it a meal. But do we go away filled? Well, no, it's not the same as having chicken dinner. It's not the same as mashed potatoes and gravy. It's not the same as we men have downstairs sometimes possum gravy. We call it possum gravy. It's not really possum, but we call it that. It's not the same. We go away from that meal filled and satisfied. This meal, you probably will not be filled. It's not the kind of meal that is pleasing to the palate, but it's a meal that uh, is a symbolic meal. It's a meal that is a sermon within the elements, each of the elements there is a sermon that, that, is, that is told in the juice which speaks of the blood and the bread which speaks of the broken body which gives strength and gives life and gives us the ability to live a life free from the slavery to sin. Amen? We are not to live in the bondage of sin. We are not to live in the slavery to sin after we've come to know Jesus Christ. And we have that means not to do that. Here it is in the Word of God. We read the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to bless the Word in our life, and if we do that, we'll be able to live the kind of life that will be a, a, a testimony unto the Lord. So it was at the Passover the Lord Jesus instituted this meal for you and I tonight. The Passover taught and reminded all of Israel of their deliverance from Egypt. When the Passover lamb was killed and the blood was placed upon the doorpost, the firstborn of every Jewish family inside that home was preserved from the death angel as the death angel passed over. But well, that was not the case for all of the unbelieving in Egypt because they did not have the blood applied to the door of their, of their dwelling. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb rescued the Jewish firstborn from death, it's the blood of Jesus that saves us from the condemnation of our sin while the bread, His Word, gives us strength to live a life free from the slavery to sin. Well, the Passover. The Bible says here that the Passover began at evening. In the, look what it says, verse 14, chapter 2 of the book of Luke. It says, And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Did you ever ask yourself what determined the hour that they were to have this feast? You know, we say, well, they did it on the 15th of Niacin, but was there anything that actually contributed to to that. Well, as I begin to do some reading and some reference work on that, go with me back to the book of Genesis. You're going to find something here that if you would dig into this particular chapter in the Word of God, you would find that this chapter lays the foundation for the hour of the Passover, for the hour that the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper at the Passover. It was in the evening. And back in Genesis chapter 15, and you're familiar with a man by the name of Abraham, God said to Abraham that he was going to make of Abraham a great nation. And in this chapter, God covenant with Abraham, between he and Abraham, that he was going to fulfill this promise that he made to him. And there's a little bit of dialogue that goes on in this chapter. I'd like to pick it up with you, if I may. Chapter 15, verse 2, Abraham is talking to God, and Abraham said, Lord God, wherewith wilt thou give me, seeing that I go childless? Now, God told Abraham he was going to make, make of him a, a great nation. And yet, at the same time, Abraham was childless. All the promise that God had made, yet Abraham, as he looked upon this promise, he said, Lord, I don't have a son yet. Did Abraham ever question the sovereign will of God? I think he did. Because as you read down through here, he offered to say to God, he says, I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. He was saying that Eleazar, Eleazar could become the progenitor, and that's how I could become a great nation, a great people. And God says, no, Abraham, that's not the way it's going to be. And God reminded Abraham in verse 7, I want you to see verse 7, it's a great verse, it's a verse that the Lord spoke to me about this past week. And he said to Abraham, 
in this verse, he's reminding Abraham of his person, of his power, and of his plan. Look at the verse. And he said unto him, I am the Lord. Sometimes you and I have problems and situations and problems of life, and we begin to take matters into our own hands, do we not? We fret because you're taking matters into your own hands. You worry. I do too. We fret and we worry. And God has to remind us, I am the Lord. I asked you a question, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Is there any sickness? Is there, is there any mountain that he can't move? Anything that he can't intervene in? No, there is nothing according to his will that he will not, he cannot work it. He can work in all situations of life. And that's what he's saying to Abraham. He says, I am the Lord. And then he says, that brought thee out of Ur of, Ur of Chaldees. He is reminding Abraham of his power. I ask you a question. Does God have power this morning to work in your situation? Yes, he does. Does God have the power to provide healing and strength and miracles and wisdom? You know, we talked about that Wednesday night. We talked about how that in the past, God confirmed the message of the prophets through signs and wonders and miracles. He did it during the days of Jesus. When Jesus ministered, he did the same thing. And he did it during the first part of the book of Acts when the apostles began their ministry. But when you get... From chapter 10 on in the book of Acts, you don't see a whole lot of it. or some, but not a lot of it. So we ask the question, well, God doesn't work any more miracles today. But yes, he does. He does intervene. He does answer prayer. But he doesn't have to work in a miracle to give confirmation that that which he's doing is of him. All you've got to do is pick up this book and read this book, and you know it's God. It's all God. Every bit of it's God's word. And he speaks through his word to you and I. He says to Abraham, I brought you out of the Ur of Chaldees. God reminded Abraham of his person. He reminded him of his power. And then he says, to give thee this land to inherit. There's the plan. The person, the power, and the plan. Abraham questioned, no doubt, the sovereign will of God. And God reminded Abraham, Abraham, I have a plan. I'm going to work this plan out. And here's how I'm going to confirm the plan to you, Abraham. Now, we're talking about how do we determine that the Passover began at the time the Passover began. God says to Abraham, Abraham, here's the plan that I have. Here's what I want you to do. If you read on down through the verse, it says in verse 9, he said unto him, Take me a heifer and three years old and a she-goat and three years old and a ram and a three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. If you know the count of this, this was a way that men would confirm covenants between men. So if you and I had something that we was going to enter into an agreement over, this was one of the methods that were used in that day to confirm a covenant. It was a costly procedure because we had to take these animals, offer these animals, literally butcher these animals, and we would lay them in a row on either side. And then what you and I would do if we was entering into agreement, we would pass between this, these carnage of animals, and that, that symbolically, that was a way that we... Uh, approved or we notarized, if you will, of the covenant that we were making between each other about whatever thing we was agreeing to do. God said to Abraham, this is what I want you to do. And Abraham began to do that which God asked him to do. And as you read down through this chapter as what unfolds, the Bible says in verse 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark, beholding a smoking furnace and a burning lamp had passed between those pieces. Abraham, after he had done what God asked him to do, back up in verse 11, it says, And the fowls came down upon the carcass, and Abraham drove them away. And it says, When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. What is happening here, if you notice these fowl that came, do you not know that Satan was certainly observant to what God wanted to do in the life of Abraham? You know, when God makes a promise to you or to me, make no mistake, the tempter will come and try to rob you of the blessing of the promise. Do you know that? If you read this, it says the fowls came upon the carcass and Abraham drove them away. When God makes a promise... Satan sometimes wants to steal our faith to believe God. Abraham was waiting on God, and God hadn't showed up. He thought God wasn't on time, but I want you to know God's always on time. He's just you and I get ahead of God sometimes. And what happened here in this account, this covenant that God said, I'm going to make you a great nation, Abraham, and here's how I'm going to do it. This covenant's going to be between you and between me, you and me, and don't forget, Abraham, who I am and the power I have and the plan that I have for you. Now, here's we're going to ratify this whole deal. You get the 
two rows of animals. And so Abraham did that, and he had to shoo the birds away, which is a type of how Satan comes to try to steal the blessings that God wants to give to us. And uh, what happened was Abraham fell asleep. And lo and behold, as you read on down here in verse 17 and 18, what happened? Well, when you read that and study that a little bit, God showed up, and God passed between the carnage of these two rows of animals, and God passed between them. And you know what God was saying to Abraham? God was saying to Abraham, you know, Abraham, as much as you think you have a part in this, you don't. This whole thing is totally, completely dependent upon me. You've been looking at this promise that I made to you, Abraham, as if it was totally dependent upon you because he was looking at it through his human eyes. And isn't that what we do? We look at problems and trials and tests and situations of life. We look at it through our human eyes. We see how hard, how difficult, how impossible. And we fret and we worry and we grumble and we moan and we groan. But listen, when we learn to get a hold of the horns of the altar of God and God says, I've made this promise and I'm going to fulfill this promise, I promise you God will never, ever, ever, ever renege on a promise he made. God was telling to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to pay the tab. I'm going to pay the bill. I'm going to pay the price. He passed between these two rows of carnage in the... And if you read this here in verse 17, when the sun went down, it was dark, and behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. It was God himself passing between those pieces. And he was saying to Abraham, Abraham, you don't have anything to do with this. You just stand back and watch the show. I'm going to pay the debt that's going to make this all come to pass. And when you look at this, when you look at this and study this a bit, we have a type of our salvation. You know, if you ever go out to eat with somebody, you go out to eat with Tony, and Tony says, well, you know what, Brother Steve, I'm going to buy you a steak dinner, and I'm going to pay everything, pay the whole tab. Steve goes out and says, I'll have me a 25-ounce sirloin steak and charge it to Tony. Tony's going to pay the whole tab. I want you to know God paid the tab on your salvation and my salvation. He paid the debt that set us free so that you and I can receive this wonderful gift that he purchased in your behalf and my behalf. Now, when did he do this? He did this at evening, and he did this on a certain day. Go back with me to the book of Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, the Lord is instituting this promise. He's t God told Abraham, and we didn't read all the chapter, but he told Abraham that the nation of Israel, the people that was going to come from him, they were going to be in bondage in a land that was not their land for 400 years. God told that to Abraham back in chapter 15, if we sat and tore that chapter completely apart. And he said to Abraham, he said, I'm going to deliver them out of that land. And I'm going to take them to a land that's going to become their land. In Exodus chapter 12, there's a play on words here. And when I studied this play on words out, this is what I learned. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 41, it says this, And it came to pass at the end of 400 years, 430 years, even the self same day. You see that? It came to pass that all the host of Israel went out of the land of Egypt. You know what, it was, you know what that's saying when it says the self same day? It's reference to Genesis chapter 15 it's reference to the promise that God made to Abraham that he fulfilled to Abraham on the 15th of Niacin in the evening. It's a reference to the fact that God delivered the nation of Israel on the self same day. You know, we ask ourselves the question, what did, when did the Passover occur? It occurred on the day that God came to Abraham and conferred that covenant with Abraham. That Passover, when it was observed and it was sacrificed and the lamb was offered and the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread and all the above, it occurred on the selfsame day that God made that covenant with Abraham. And all these years later, this nation of people has been observing the Passover. And it's at this point in time that Jesus Christ institutes the Lord's Supper. On the self same day. Isn't that amazing? To me, that's an amazing thing. It might not be an amazing thing to you. Well, it is to me. I think it's an amazing thing. Well, what does all that mean to you and I this morning? What does all that mean to you and I? Well, there's a lot of sacredness and there's a lot of importance things that we need to consider. Well, just let me give you a few. Go with me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. When you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
What does the Lord's table mean to you and I? Well, this is a very sacred feast, obviously, that you and I enjoy, that you and I celebrate. It's a feast that is set aside at a certain time. We come together when we worship the Lord. As I told you, we do it quarterly. Some churches do it every Sunday. They observe the Lord's table. But it reminds us of what Jesus Christ did for us. It's a pretty important time. As the Jews observed the Passover, every year on the 15th of Niacin, it was a sacred, reverential time. And it was during that time that the Lord instituted the Lord's table. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the church of Corinth, you know and I know, was a pretty worldly church. Had a lousy reputation. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, Paul, as he writes to the church of Corinth, he says this, Purge out therefore the old leaven. When the feast of Passover was observed, and the feast of unleavened bread right on the heels of that, the Jewish women, according to the tradition, would clean out anything that was in their pantry, apple pie, cherry, I don't know if they had apple pies back then or not, maybe they had figgy pudding or whatever, but they would clean out anything that had leaven from their house. And the Lord is speaking to the church of Corinth, and he's speaking to us this morning as we come to take this table, that we need to examine our hearts. Like Patty sang the song this morning, Search me, O Lord, know me. We need to ask the Lord to examine our hearts. That which was in our heart, a bitter spirit, a gossiping tongue, uh, a vain imagination, a heart that is uh, quick to find fault, the Lord says, purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. Purge out the old leaven. Salvation is not in sin, but salvation is from sin. And the church of Corinth was clearly a church that needed a lesson on purging out the old leaven. Purge out the old leaven. Charles Spurgeon said this, salvation in sin is not possible. It must always be salvation from sin. The church is to be without sin, from sin. This is the table for the redeemed who've made a decision to come to Jesus Christ. And when we made a decision to come to Jesus Christ, we leave, we leave symbolically the old leaven at the altar. Look what he says in verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice, wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. With sincerity and truth. What does the Gospel of John say? The Gospel of John says, The hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship God in sincerity and in truth. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. As we approach this table, we need to be very transparent before the Lord in sincerity and truth. He says, Purge out the old leaven. Notice what he says in verse 8. He says, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven. What is he talking about? He's talking about self-judgment of our lives so that we don't come to this table uh, without preparing our heart. We examine our obedience to the Lord. And then in the latter portion of verse 8, he says, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is God saying to us this morning as we take this table? Before we take this table, before we take the bread, before we take the cup, we need to look into the mirror of God's Word. We've already done that this morning. We've briefly looked into the mirror of God's Word, but we've gleaned enough from the Word this morning to know that as we take this table, we don't want to take it unworthily having not prepared our heart. We want to look into the mirror of God's Word in sincerity and in truth. And as we do that, we're doing what the Lord asked us to do. We're making sure there's nothing between our soul and the Savior. So I'll leave that with you this morning. And I want us this morning to take our hymnal and turn to page 390. And perchance this morning the Lord has spoke to your heart in the course of this message. Maybe as we sing the song, you might not even want to, you might just want to bow your head. You might want to come to the altar. That's fine. And spend some time at the altar and then go back to your pew. Uh, but it's a time that we need to examine our heart before we take this table and, and, and the bread and, and the cup. And examine our heart before the Lord. Perhaps you're here this morning, and I trust we all know the Lord, but maybe you don't. Right there where you are, you can ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life and be your Lord and Savior. 
And that's so important. You don't, this table is for the redeemed of the Lord, those who know Jesus Christ. It's not for those who don't know Christ. There's a lot of meals that you can eat in this world, but this is one that the unsaved doesn't want to eat. And also this is one that the saved who have not prepared their heart doesn't want to eat because the Bible says in the book of Corinthians there were some that died premature deaths because they failed to look into the mirror. They failed to examine themselves. So as we take our hymnal this morning, let's just sing page 390, the first and last verse. And I'll ask the elders to come forward on the last verse and take their places. Let's all stand. your spirit would meet with us today. We ask that we might examine our heart and we thank you for this time that we can take this table. For we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.